Good day, everyone. Welcome to another edition of our Wednesday online service. Tagged Wednesday. Today we will be having our Bible study on the gospel. Please kindly stay with us and stay blessed. Let's be in the mood of worship. Let's begin to thank him for the gift of life. Let's thank him that we are not dead. Let's thank him, O oh Lord, that we are able to see another bright new day. Let's begin to thank him for security. Let's begin to thank him that we are not part of the dead ones. Let's begin to thank him, O oh Lord, as we are going out, we are coming in. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Let's begin to ask for forgiveness. If there's anything that we've done contrary to his word, that the Lord God should forgive us. Let's ask him to write our name in the book of life and cleanse us of all our iniquities. Let's begin to ask him for forgiveness. Because if you sin, you're not going to be partaking of this world today. Let's begin to ask for forgiveness. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Let's begin to ask him, O oh Lord, that everything that we're going to learn today, that let it be of him and not of anyone. That shall, we, shall only be, we shall be hearers and doers of your word. Let's begin to ask him, O oh Lord, for divine intervention in, of today's word. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Let's begin to ask him for whatever we are looking unto him for. Whatever your desires are on, for the Lord grant unto us in the name of Jesus. Whatever that we are looking for to, towards to, for the Lord please grant unto us in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for the unforeseen battles you've done for us. Let your name be exalted on high in Jesus' name. We come before you as your child, O oh Lord, as your children, O oh Lord. Father, Lord, please forgive us of every iniquities in the name of Jesus, O oh Lord. We come that you should invite your presence, O oh Lord. Let your power come over us in the name of Jesus. We cannot do anything without your presence, O oh Lord. So we invoke your power and the Holy Spirit upon us in the name of Jesus, O oh Lord. Whatever we are looking forward to, O oh Lord, let it be unto pass in the name of Jesus, O oh Lord. And we ask, O oh Lord, that as today, O oh Lord, our lives will never remain the same in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what you do for us. Thank you for what you've been doing for us. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. Bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. Lover of our soul, we bless you. We appreciate you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank 
everybody. Um, it's another wonderful, wonderful edition of our Wordness Day service. And um, for those of us that has been following the series before now, we can testify of how interesting and educative it has been. Um, so in the same way, this evening, we will be talking about something very, very important. And um, uh, we are not just going to talk about it alone. We are going to talk about it with respect to what the Word of God says. We're talking about the Gospel today. And um, with me and members of the PSF Bible Study Department, um, I'll have them introduce themselves from the far right. Wali Ojuola. Um, my name is Sonny Lua Damlola Johnson. My name is Olua Tuya Konde. All right, and as you all know, I'm Temitope Muniz. All right, so uh, we are talking about the gospel, and without further ado, we'll dive straight into what we would have for everyone today. What exactly is the gospel? I know a lot of us have heard about it at one point in time or the other in our lives. Uh, most of us can tell us a lot of things about what we think the gospel is, but we want to look at it from the context of the word of God. What exactly is the gospel? Tell me. Um, thank you for that question. Well, I think the gospel, the gospel, just like it sounds, God spelled, God is being spelled out to man. And this is done on the person and the image of Christ. Now, the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, there about was saying that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So when we are trying to share the gospel, we are trying to present Christ to mankind. And how is this done? We cannot present the person of Christ without talking about what Christ has done, which is the birth and the death and the resurrection of Christ. From the book of First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 was making us to understand that. And it, if you see, just like so popularly, people say the gospel is the good news. It's not a lie. Because Christ, sharing Christ is the good news. And how is this the good news? Because Definitely, the status of man naturally is the status of death. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 proves it. So we are dead already because we are coming from the, the, the image of Adam. So we are dead naturally. And man is condemned because the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 3 that for, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin also is death. So we are already condemned and we are supposed to die. We are already dead, like dead in sin. But the good news, which is the gospel, is that the things that Christ has come to do is to save man, that man has an expected end. So man is not dead any longer, but we can be alive in Christ. This is just the gospel. Thank you very much for that wonderful, wonderful description. So you made mention of something about the gospel being God being spelled to man. I love that. But there is something I quickly want to ask. Can we now say there is a very big similarity or it is the same thing when we say the gospel is the good news? Yes, very, we, very correct. We can say the gospel is the good news. So does this mean that every form of gospel must always contain the good news? Yes. Because what is the good news? The good news is actually the, the, the news that um, as believers, we, as, uh, even, you know, the gospel first and foremost is to those who, um, who are lost like... So we are telling them that there's a gift that awaits you. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that the gift of, the gift of salvation. So there's a gift. Just like if I come bearing gifts, I'm bringing you good news. And that's why you see the, the Christmas period, they say good tidings and all. I'm coming to you. I'm bringing good news to you. I'm presenting you with something that is being replaced with your present status of death. That you don't need, Christ has died for you, is definitely a good news. That's very interesting. And um, I'm very happy that um, Dami has been able to establish very clearly that the gospel is the good news. We have a lot of preachers today who are actually preaching, but it is not everybody that is preaching the gospel. And it is not everybody that is preaching the good news. So it is very important for us to understand that the gospel of Jesus is the good news. And what is the good news? That Jesus Christ came to die for man. That's very interesting. We are proceeding this evening and we are looking at the mission and the vision. Is there even anything like the mission and vision of the gospel? You want to try, um, Toy? Okay, yes, I think so. Because if there is no stated purpose for anything, of course, there's abuse. 
for that. So if we're going to say that we have a gospel, what does this gospel mean? What is it supposed to do? I think the vision of the gospel is that all men be saved and they will come to the knowledge of the truth. First Timothy um, 2 verse 4. I like that particular verse because it reminds us that God was intentional about every single person. He decided that every everybody was going to come to him. So he didn't leave anybody estranged and he out of his loving kindness, he didn't need to do it, actually. He could have left us, but he decided that all men would be saved and they would come to the knowledge of truth. And then, how then will this happen? It, it says there that we're given the um, ministry of reconciliation. So, um, if we do not preach, if we do not talk about it, if we do not spread this gospel, then we are already condemning people to death. If we do not teach about it, we're already telling people that they might as well die. We do not care. And, you know, in a way, sometimes I see that, even I myself included, we get so relaxed because we know this good news. But what about the people that do not know it? Are we saying that you guys can die for all we care? That's not supposed to be it. Because if Jesus didn't come, then, I mean, we won't be. So that grace we have received, we must also pass it on. To every other person. So you ha- and another thing is that the gospel, there's an end at the end. If you don't make a choice, you have made a choice. Without making your choice, it's like we we keep saying that oh, all of us have free will and all of that. But if you do not make a choice, That's the indecision, you have made a choice by that. It's default. So in in the gospel, we have to like do it consciously so that people do not end up paying for what they have not, um, for what they did not thoroughly understand. Because if you eventually get to understand the gospel, it's, it's something that is too good to be true. But maybe because a lot of people do not understand it, or it has been painted in a wrong light, they feel, they fear it. But um, that's one of the mandates of believers, to spread the gospel, talk about it. The way we talk about every other thing that we we are excited about. Talk about the good news. Tell everybody about it. John 3.16, we all know that, but people need to internalize it, that this gospel is for everybody. It's not just for a particular set of people. It's not just for the church boys and the church girls. It's for everybody. Wow, that's very, very, very deep. That's very deep. And, um, you know, you've been able to very clearly establish that the mission is to spread the message of light to everybody and the, the, the how, that's the, the vision, I beg your pardon, is to spread the message of light and the mission is by the ministry of reconciliation. That's very, very key. But you know, you made mention of something about um, people, people spreading this message out of eagerness, out of happiness, like they being excited about spreading the good news. We don't see much of that today. What do you think is the cause of that? We don't see so many. Yes, we have a couple of people preach, but the zeal, the excitement, like it should be. You know that first love that the Bible talks about. We don't really see it in people. What do you think? What do you think is responsible for that? I think that a lot of people have been brought up in fear. So it has covered what the good news is supposed to be. Especially if we see in the um, Nigerian church, as a whole, uh, I'm not pointing specifically, but generally, that if you ask sense. the theology of a lot of people, you'd see that they do not fully understand what this gospel is. They just, most times, it, is, it looks like condemnation. So people do not see the joy. But until you start, um, until people are taught properly, until they see that that's, that wasn't God's plan. He's not talking about the condemnation. That's not the focus of the gospel. It's a byproduct. It's something that happens as a byproduct. But if you are if you're focusing on the gospel, you know that this is good news. You know that it was God reaching out to you even when you did not deserve it. You didn't even know about it. The Bible says why we are yet sinners. Christ died for us. We didn't know about these things. We didn't have it. But he decided that, oh, I'm going to love them, this one. I'm going to take them up and I'm going to love them so much. So once people realize that, you would know that the good news is important. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you've been able to establish that the reason people don't, don't you know, preach the gospel with a lot of zeal and um, 
enthusiasm is because of a partial knowledge of what the gospel really means. That's very interesting. So moving forward, we want to look at um, the need and um, the importance of the gospel. Like, what exactly is it supposed to be for? Why? That's like the exact why of the gospel. And I'll have Wale do justice to that. Okay, um, the need for the gospel, for you to know the need, you have to go from, like, the beginning. You have to go from a certain place. If something has a need, then that means there was a cause. Because it's, the gospel is like a, a, a response to something. So why do we need the gospel? From the beginning, you could see that man fell. Man sinned. And that's what um, Dami was explaining in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, where he said that, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. Now, it is, it is questionable to say, I was just born. When did I sin? How did I sin? Where did I sin? And that's why you understand Romans chapter 6, where he said that, as it, Romans chapter 6 or 1 Corinthians 15, that says that um, through one man, sin came into the world, and through another man we have life. So sin came through Adam. From the beginning, then you could see, if you see Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says that all men could think was consistently evil. That God was sorry that he created man. The Bible, God was sad that he created man. Why? Because man could only consistently do evil. So that, was, that is now the need for the gospel. In fact, if you see the book of 1 Corinthians 2, Ephesians 3, you see where Paul was saying that this plan, this mysterious plan has been from the beginning. That's this gospel. The plan has been from the beginning that man will be saved from the sin that has been committed. So the need for the gospel is that God wants to draw men back to himself. That's what the ministry of reconciliation that Tony was pointing out. God, that's the need. He wants to have a fellowship. He does not want man to be separated from him. If you check the book of um, Ephesians 2, it says once you were enemies of God. So God does not want man to be enemies of, with him because the initial plan was not that man will be his enemy. It was that man will have fellowship with him. That's why he used to come every day, every evening to come and do what? Have fellowship with Adam. So that's God's plan. God created man for his pleasure. Where God derives pleasure is in the place of fellowship. Where he has communion. As I, I think in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 1 or thereabouts, it says even though your sins are as red as scarlet or this or this, he says that, come, let us do what? Let us reason together. He's interested in a dialogue. He's interested in communication. He's, God is a God of, of fellowship. He's a God of family. And that's why when we became born again, we became born again through his son so that we might become sons. Mm. So God wants a family. Angels cannot be God's family. They are not God's family. They are God's servants. So God built a family in Adam. But because of the turning away from him in the place of sin, through Eve, I know it's no women, it's no women's fault, but then... <laughs> Through Eve and then through Adam, because Adam also had it in mind. The Bible said that the devil was talking to Eve, and then Eve turned to give Adam the, the fruit. That means Adam was there when they were having that dialogue. And he did not rebuke Eve and say, no, don't do that. He did not rebuke the devil and say, go away, why are you tempting my wife? He stayed there and enjoyed it. So he had fallen. So Jesus Christ now had to come to repair the damage, to build the bridge. That we are now sons. Let me quickly read Romans 5. Romans 5 from verse 1, NLT says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Christ the Jesus has done. We now have peace with God. We are no more at enmity with God. So that's the need for the gospel. That's the importance of the gospel. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And um, you know, it's interesting you were able to clearly establish that uh, the need of the gospel is that God wants to reestablish that relationship that he intended for man with him from the beginning. That's very profound because um, um, one of the things you also said was, was that um, it was in the original plan of God. And why I agree with you was that in the beginning, the Bible says God created Adam and put him in the garden, created Eve, put her in the garden. And every evening, he was always coming down to fellowship. So you see, um, it has been in the character of God to fellowship with man. I see, see. Thank you very much for that, for that answer. Um, moving forward this evening, we are looking at more important things about the gospel. And um, looking at the way the gospel is growing these days, most or all of us will agree that the gospel is really growing fast. But is the gospel really fulfilling its purpose? Is the gospel really doing that which God intends it to do? Dami, you want to give a try? Um, yeah. To me, I believe the gospel is still fulfilling its purpose. The thing is, 
the purpose for the gospel did not start in the book of Matthew. It started from the beginning. And that's why in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, there about, I was talking about the choice that I give you life. I behold, I, 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 I present to you life and death. So, that I will employ you to choose life. So, the gospel is the gospel that has been presented since that time. So, right now, no matter how worldly the world may seem, or no matter the amount of sin that may fill the world, in the book of Romans chapter 5, verse 20, it says, where iniquity abounded, that grace much more abounds. So, you, you, one of the things that comes with the gospel is grace, that we are saved through grace. So, definitely, the gospel is still fulfilling purpose because no matter how we see it, men are still being saved. The replication of the person of Christ in men is still happening. Men are still coming. And one of the goals of the gospel is that man should have eternal life, right? And the knowledge of the eternal life, according to the book of John 17, 3, says that this is life eternal, that ye know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom that he has sent. So, definitely, the aspect of eternal life is still being revealed daily, irrespective of how much sin that we have in the world. So if you are at home, or you are, you are, you are, you are, you are you're seated and you're thinking, oh, with the way sin is plenty in the world now, is there a place for me? See, definitely there's a place for you because the gospel is still saving men even till this day. That's wonderful. Um, I, I love the part where you made it clear to the viewers that there is a place for everyone. You know, it, it really looks um, like the gospel in this age and time is incompetent. Um, it looks like the gospel is so, so little in proffering an answer to most of the problems of the world today. But I thank God because you have been able to really establish the power in the gospel. The Bible says Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. And the gospel, of course, is the message of Christ. So you've been able to establish clearly that even though it is looking like um, in the world today there are so many problems, the gospel still carries its power. power. That's very, very important. We are moving forward and we are looking at certain ways that um, the gospel has suffered. Even though the gospel has met its purpose, even though the gospel is still carrying its power, we cannot but agree that in one of few ways, the gospel has suffered. What are those ways? Toy. Okay. So, um, I think it's very important to know that no matter how good, um, there will always be challenges. And because this world is falling, it is corrupted already. There will always be challenges. So the first thing I think that um, in that's the gospel that makes it suffer is false teachings. Now, people have perverted this gospel, changed it into what is not supposed to be. And because of that, the reception, first of all, is affected. The delivery is affected. People do not want to, people have a bias against it because someone else has already taught something that is wrong towards them. Um, let's take, for example, now, I'm, a sh I'm shaking this table. But if we're going to look at this Trump thing, now, if we look at the way the evangelicals have, handed, have, have handled the situation, it makes you begin to wonder that is um, the church a tool for politics? Thereby, it's affecting the delivery of the message because you have centered it around a particular person. You have left Christ as the focus. And now it's around a person. So if that person does not... Um, coming to be and if it does if that person is not uh I don't, I don't want to use some words but if that doesn't happen it looks like god is not doing anything is that the gospel in any way how does that relate to the gospel if we take the focus of anything and we begin to use it in another way it would affect the delivery of what is supposed to be um what is supposed to happen the outcome of the um the actual outcome of the purpose of that thing. If we have taken the um, the use of the gospel and we have put it in another dimension, it's going to rubbish the main reason of the gospel. So there's that. There's misplaced priorities too. So when you put um, the gospel as something at the back of your mind, a, a, a back thought, a last minute thought, last resort, um, God is 
just a last resort sometimes I think about him well when everything is about to go bad child that's when I'll not remember God but if he was at the fourth center of your life then everybody would be able to see it and then the gospel would prosper I, I think that we must always remember that the gospel is not somebody else's duty to proclaim it is each and everybody's duty if I take it seriously if I do my own duty, if everybody thought like that, then the gospel would reach it to go far and wide because people relate to convictions. If I talk to you about something and I know about it, you will know when I'm speaking about it. It's not for knowledge. It's not something you, I'm, I'm just, um, you know, winging. I know about these things and then I'm speaking about it. So, you know, those are some of the things, misplaced priorities, people don't want to, then there are biases already. So people already have biases against the gospel. They've been, they've been um, taught a lot of things. That Sometimes you have people, sorry to cut you short, mm -hmm. you have people who don't want to proclaim the gospel because they are not even convinced. You see people preaching messages that they are not personally convinced about. Exactly. They are preaching because they heard somebody say it, because their pastors say so, because they're ready. We don't have people who are preaching the gospel from the place of experience. But exactly, I agree. Somewhere yeah. in the Bible, Wale, um, Jesus says that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So what can we say to this? This is not your question. Your question is coming, but I just wanted to, I, I just wanted to share your thoughts on, on that aspect. What can we see about that with respect to the current challenges we are facing? Because, I mean, Jesus already says I will build my church and the gates of hell. But yet we still have challenges. Okay, um, first of all, I'd like to reemphasize what Twain said. Regardless of the kind of movement it is, it will always face challenges. So even Jesus Christ said, um, I leave my peace with you, not as the word giveth, but um, the one I give, I, I leave with you also. And then if you check the book of Psalm 23, the Bible says that, though you walk through the valley of shadow of death, you fear no evil. So if you check consistently through the scriptures, the church, what we call challenges, actually, are things that we should expect. Persecution, for example. I'm always surprised when um, we are complaining that they're persecuting us. When Jesus Christ said in the book of Matthew chapter 10 that they will flog you for the sake of the gospel. He said, expect persecution. So the real challenges that the gospel are fa is facing, like she, like she said, is false teaching one. There's, there's almost no knowledge of the truth. We are supposed to teach the truth for what it is. Teach the Bible as it has been written. Now, if Jesus Christ said that, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, who are you focusing on? If you're not focusing on Jesus, then Jesus is not the one building that church. Now, the church is the person, the, the group of people. The gathering of the saints is the church. So if, it's, if we are not focusing on Jesus, who then is building us? It would then be easy for the gates of hell to prevail because it is not Jesus that is building us. So our focus must always be on, this, on, the, on Jesus Christ, even in the place of studying the scriptures. Because you are reading your Bible does not mean you are focusing on Jesus. It is very easy to perverse the scriptures. That's why we have false teachers and false prophets. The person that, I, I, I used to tell my friends that the person that will poison you will not bring sniper to you whole and say drink. No. If you put the sniper inside food. A food you love. So half kind of truth. I, I'm, half truth is as dangerous as full lie. Mm -hmm. So what are, you, what are you focused on? That's why Jesus Christ said in the book of John chapter 5, verse 39, probably my favorite scripture this, uh, this period, he says that, he says. He, exactly, you, you search the scriptures because you think the scriptures give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to who? Me. Jesus. So you will always face challenges. How you overcome these challenges is by staying in that picture of Jesus Christ that you have received, what has Jesus sent you? People will attack what Jesus has sent you, definitely. But our hope, that's why Paul said that if our, if our hope is only in this world, we are for all men most what, miserable. That's the reason why we used to crumble or bend to these challenges is because we feel that ah, this gospel that we are preaching is to give us money. This gospel that we are preaching is to make us uh, have car. This gospel that we are preaching is to do this. So the challenges of, this, of, the, of, of the gospel also it's not just in the place of all this uh, false teaching. Also, the challenge is money. <laughs> don't because they, because they are preaching the gospel, you are lazy and they don't want to work. 
the more reason why you even work hard at your job and make money is because of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So let, let that's just, that's let that's really that profound. That and um, you know, time will not permit us, but I would have loved us to continue. But you know, you said something that uh, I wanted to just um, shed more light on briefly. You established that it is expected that there are challenges. So just tell us one way, one way of preventing the gospel from facing challenges. Just one. Um, way. I think I already mentioned the one way I would like to emphasize on because I feel if the foundation is well laid, every other thing that you build will easily fit. And that is teaching. When I say the gospel, what do you hear when I come to preach the gospel? You see, the first thing I tell you is that, ah, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, a fire. <laughs> that's, that's not what Jesus Christ did. It's not a matter of a fire. The first thing is help the person recognize what the gospel really entails. Empathy gets to people more. Have compassion. Many people preach the gospel without compassion. It, the power of the gospel is love. If you don't preach the gospel with love, you can never save a soul. So you see, Bible says Jesus had compassion. Jesus had compassion. Jesus had compassion. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. The reason why he gave us Jesus Christ was because of love. So if you don't operate in love, you can't explain Jesus. Why? First John chapter, I think First John 4. First John 4, I think verse 8 or thereabouts. It says that um, whoever does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. So if you want to teach the gospel, if you want to correct the challenges of the gospel, the issues of the gospel, teach your gospel with love. And then you see changes in the hearts of men because they see the genuineness that you are bringing to them about this truth. Ah, you are truly saved though. You are truly born again. In fact, hell is real, truly. Now, this is not taking away. Hell is very, very real and it burns. But God does not want you to be there. So he loves mm. you so much that he sent himself. God wow. came in the form of man. God died that you might be saved. That's how important your own soul, your singular soul is to God. By the time they see the love that God has for them, men will turn rather than just push them out and condemn them. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. So when you Jesus. preach the gospel without condemnation, you save more souls. Wonderful, wonderful. Viewers at home, I believe we have had a very interesting and educative time this evening. Um, as much as I'd have loved us to continue, time will not permit me. So I want to encourage us to join us again, same time, next week Wednesday, for another interesting, interesting session of the Word Nesty service from the Living Sea Church, Omoli. And on that note, this evening, I'll be signing out. God bless you. It's time to give our offerings. To give your offering, the account details will be displayed on the screen. Or you can give via our website at www.rccglse.org forward slash online giving. May the Lord bless you as you give your offering. Amen. Our Father and our God, we appreciate you for your loving kindness. We thank you, God Almighty, for your provision. We thank you, God Almighty, for the blessings of the offerings you've given to us. We say, be thou exalted in Jesus' name. We thank you, God Almighty, for blessing our finances, for blessing our pockets, to even be able to give to you today. We say, God Almighty, that you accept our offerings in the mighty name of Jesus. Even as we continue, we pray that you bless us and keep us and guide our paths in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we've prayed. Amen. Wow, that was an amazing section of our Bible study. Hope you enjoyed it, because I did. Please don't forget to follow us on our social media platform and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you. Remain blessed. See you next week. Bye.